relationship with Jean who had weak ankles. My father was lost to crocodiles. He works in a crocodile farm. We used his letters to light fires as the paper was very dry and inflammable. The school had wire all round it. It was high up, above the town. Through a six-foot fence, I could see a row of terraced houses with neat curtains and polished letterboxes. I whispered to passing strangers on the way to the shops to get me out. I tried to pass messages to them written on scraps of toilet paper, but they didn't turn their heads. I wore a hat in the shape of a door wedge with thin elastic under my chin. Frank had a flat cap. Our clothes were weighty with name tapes. We stood in the playground trying to be invisible, drinking from dwarf bottles of clean milk with straws. Our ties were strangling us, but if you took your tie off, then Mr. Whitebait, the headmaster, led you to his parlour with a picture of Winston Churchill above the mantelpiece and attacked the palms of your hands with a baton. I couldn't believe that he dared to do this to Frank. Frank was Einstein. Once on their own, they stopped trying to be women and became loose and funny, as if their bodies were clones, released from their hands. They lounged loosely over the edges of the wash basins. They calculated the bank accounts and backgrounds of potential partners. They, they wanted servants and patios, leisure and rose gardens, and, and bedrooms to rest in. They didn't know then, these clever women, how those floral middle-class rooms would become prisons, and how they would end up bewildered, standing at dawn in the garden in a pair of old trousers, trying to work out with them. You're playing havoc with my mind. Playing havoc with my mind, you're playing havoc with my mind. I got a bad case, I can't concentrate. Not to mention that I can't relate. Whoever said that love is blind was right. Woo hoo hoo, I can't stop thinking about you. Every couple of years in the writing, it actually started. Anthony Crowley, the author, his sister travelled overseas for. 18 months, I think, and worked through Europe and Britain, and uh, kept sending him sort of letters and postcards and whatever. And most of the events that happen in the show are, are directly related to things that actually happened to, to Kathy. Mostly exaggerated upon and mm. fictionalised, and and they're sort of moulded into the story of a young Australian girl take, going through the same kind of experience, taking that trip through Europe. Now, this is um, a completely Australian owned, written, directed, produced. It's, is this the first one that, that's happened this way? Oh, well, there's, there's certainly been... Um, it's, the, the Australian musicals had a very chequered past. <laughs> um, there have been very few successes. And I think uh, many in the past that, 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 have, that have happened have come with either foreign money or, to a degree, foreign cast. Or, 
uh, there's been very little sense in the past with Australian musicals of just trusting that that we know what we want to create, know what we want to see, uh, allow ourselves to have our own voice on stage. And um, the other problem has always been, I think, in the past with Australian musicals, is constantly looking overseas for what are what musicals should be. You know that horrible thing of. You know, I've lost count of the number of times in sort of the late 80s, early 90s, I'd be pulled along to a workshop production or whatever, and it would be set in the French Revolution or set in... I just thought, ah, oh, look, you know, no one needs another Les Mis, no one needs it. It's not your story. Don't, don't... It's someone else's story. Let them write it. What is it that you know and want to express? What is it that, that, that you can say better than anyone else in the world? And that's always been the hardest... It's been the hardest thing for for Australian theatre is, is, is putting faith in the fact that our stories are worth telling. Of course, part of the product is Amanda. How did you find her? She is an amazing talent, I have to say. The best thing about her is when we were auditioning for the show, it was hard finding someone that was willing, that, that was able to sort of sing this language because it's written in an Australian voice. It's not written in that sort of mock, stately, musical's tone that, I mean, we have a whole generation of performers that don't know anything from before Cats. We have a whole generation of performers that's never had the joy of, of any other musicals before that, so they only know a certain language. And the hard thing was finding someone that, that was a skilled enough performer, brought enough energy to it, that they were comfortable in just sort of throwing aside what worked on, on past shows and just going, well, what's, what's going to work on this? What can we do? And she's been a treasure. <laughs> so I could get a bit drunker, but um, <laughs> here I go. <laughs> I fucked up my knee while I was fucking this Greek boy, but I didn't want to tell my boyfriend, so I told him I was did at moving furniture. Uh, Neil looks at me like, you move furniture? And I say, yeah, then I moved it all back. <laughs> Neil thinks I'm mad because I want to go to the party. I say, well, why don't you stay at home and look after me? And he says he can't because his hairdresser is doing the 6am show and he needs my support. It takes Neil 45 minutes to shower and he's locked the bathroom door, which means that he's douching, which makes up my mind for me. So I wrap my crutches in alfoil to fit the space theme and I hop along beside him. Of course it takes two minutes for him to lose me or me to lose him, or for both of us to lose each other, I find myself next to Shelley, swaying under the mirror ball, wearing this Hessian bag thing. Where's Neil, she asks, which is the only thing she ever says to me except, you got any money? You got any drugs? You want that drink? Cruising, I say. She rolls her eyes. You boys. In my head I'm thinking, what the fuck does that mean? And why are you wearing that Hessian bag thing? But instead, the MDA kicks in, and I find myself with my hands down the pants of this guy who says he's Humphrey B. Bear. Well, I think that's what he says. He wants to give me a blowjob on the dance floor, like it's this fantasy of his. Come on, let me do it. Come on, let me do it. Come on, let me do it. Come on. Just as I work out how to keep my balance, Neil walks up holding a bottle of raspberry cordial, which I am dying for. He stares at me, wobbling on my crutches like a broken tripod. I point down and shout, here's Humphrey. <laughs> but Neil doesn't get the joke. He walks away, taking the cordial with him. I would care more, except the 3 a.m. show starts. Or maybe it's the 1 a.m. show, or the 5 a.m. show. Anyway. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. This incredibly beautiful drag queen or something doing this incredibly beautiful song. And may, or maybe it's this ugly troll wailing like a banshee. It doesn't matter, does it? Everyone's swaying in time and raising their hands into the air. And I do the same, which is a mistake when you're on crutches. <laughs> anyway, the lighting rig's beautiful too. It's 2 a.m. or maybe it's 4.30 a.m. or 7.17 a.m. or maybe even tomorrow. I'm sitting on the bleachers using my crutch to trip up blonde girls with ponytails, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> and one of them calls me a psychopath or maybe a sociopath or a homeopath, something like that. Anyway, I scream back, I'm not the one with the ponytail, darling, and hit her with my stick. 
which I think is hilarious. <laughs> then I notice Neil next to me, and he puts his arm around me and hugs me, and he says, we don't have to, you know. We don't have to what? Be like this, you know, like this. <laughs> this bony girl's got her mouth so close to my right ear, I think she's going to eat it. Or maybe she already has. She's been talking to me for about six hours. It must be like Tuesday already. And she's going on and on about how much she loves Amelia Moresmo and how it's not true about the human growth hormone. And some girls just have jaws like that. And I mean, what's a Moresmo? And who is this bony girl? And then she says, why can't you give yourself to anyone? And I say, what? And she says, why are you so sad? I think that's what she says. Or maybe she says, Happy New Year, Happy Mardi Gras, Happy Red Roar, Happy Winter Days, Happy Nappy Wash. I don't know, the music's really loud. <laughs> and besides, this is my favourite song, so I have to dance. I forget about the crutches and I start pirouetting this totally piss-elegant 360-degree twirling thing, which I'll regret for weeks to come. And this guy next to me says, you remind me of my washing machine. Well, I think that's what he says. And he hugs me and he rubs his sweaty chest against mine, kind of nice. And I say, do I know you? And he says, I used to be your boyfriend. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Sorry. It's 8.19am and the music's totally shit and I'm talking to yet another person I don't have any opinion of. I mean, how many of these people are there in the world? His face is coming in and out of focus like a slide projected on a sheet on a windy day and at some angles he's really cute and I remember why I'm talking to him and then it shifts and I just want to get out of there. I want to go somewhere else, somewhere soft, somewhere warm, like Neil's arms. I want Neil to hold me in his arms. And right on cue, Neil walks up. He's arm in arm with this boy I've never seen before. I'm going, he says. Where, I say. You got any acid left? I'm staring at this boy because he looks so familiar, like I know him or something. And the boy's laughing and nuzzling Neil's neck. And they walk off hand in hand. Then I work out where I know him from. It's me. He looks exactly like me, except different. Me three years ago, or maybe just six months ago, or maybe five minutes ago. I don't know. When I get home, Neil's still awake. His pupils are like saucers, his jaw is grinding, he can't keep still. And then I notice he's lumpy. He's fucked up his knee. And he says, oh, I did it moving furniture. <laughs> then I hold him and say, we can stop him now. We don't have to be like this. Or something like that. And he looks at me and says, stop that. <laughs> Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh.